Chapter 4.9.6 For many intents and purposes, war functions as a proof-of-work protocol. Why have sapiens fought and died by the millions over thousands of years? One answer is so they don't have to suffer from the oppression of a ruling class they know they cannot trust. Warfighting could just as easily be described as more than 10,000 year struggle to prevent global consolidation of abstract power and control authority over valuable resources. Sapiens have demonstrated very clearly that they would sooner risk nuclear annihilation than adopt a single ruling class. In fact, in every example of history where an emerging ruling class has attempted to gain too much abstract power and control authority over the world's natural resources or have tried to consolidate everyone under a single empire, society has responded with massive scale wars, utilizing physical power as the mechanism for adjusting the difficulty of achieving that much control. In other words, warfighting is functionally identical to Bitcoin's proof-of-work protocol. By participating in a highly energy-intensive, global-scale physical power competition, agrarian society enjoys the complex emergent benefit of decentralized control over their resources. When a population goes to war, they accept the energy expenditure and risk of injury required to keep themselves secure against the centralization of abstract power. Of course, it would be far more efficient in time, energy, money, and lives to have a single ruling class settle all property disputes, manage all the resources, and decide the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of all the property. But that would be a systemically insecure solution that is highly vulnerable to exploitation and abuse by the ruling class. This type of system would require one moral code and one moral authority which everyone would have to trust in and tacitly receive permission and approval from. No matter how many people like to virtue signal to their peers about how much they condemn physical aggression, they demonstrate through their actions that they are very well aware of this attack vector. People truly believe that peaceful adjudication methods could be used to settle all disputes and manage all resources, then people would achieve consensus on a single belief system where a single ruling class settles all disputes and manages all resources across the world. People clearly don't behave like this. They go through great lengths, spending extraordinary amounts of time and energy, risking an extraordinary amount of personal injury, explicitly to prevent people from unifying under a common belief system. Through their actions, not their words, people demonstrate that they instinctively understand that warfare has irreplaceable social benefits no matter how desperately they wish it didn't. If societies didn't have something to gain from war, there wouldn't be war. We know from the bones we dig up, from thousands of years of written testimony, and from our own experiences that people absolutely cannot be trusted with too much abstract power and control authority over us. It's simply too dangerous to give one person or one ruling class too much abstract power and control authority over any form of resource. So what do we do? We fight wars. We engage in global scale physical power competitions to ensure nobody can have too much abstract power and control over our resources. We fight to protect ourselves against the expansion of belief systems which we know are vulnerable to systemic exploitation. We fight to make sure our beliefs are adopted rather than their beliefs because we don't trust theirs or because we feel like the devil we know is preferable to the devil we don't know. Through our combined actions and behaviors, we show that we are just as wild, brutal, and unsophisticated as the animals we look down upon, no matter how much we like to wear our little lapel pins and masquerade like we're above it. Without being able to physically constrain the expansion of abstract power, there would be nothing physically preventing abstract power from spreading worldwide. Warfare gives our species an opportunity to overthrow or delegitimize abstract power when it becomes exploitative or abusive. With the ability to physically constrain and delegitimize abstract power comes the ability to physically decentralize control authority. Proof of this complex emergent behavior can easily be verified by simply noting how our species chooses to partition its territory. The reason why the dry surface area of the earth has been partitioned across 195 different countries is largely the result of the wars fought to decentralize those territories. 
If warfighting can decentralize our control authority over land, then it stands to reason that it can decentralize our control authority over other assets too, including digital resources like bits of information. The question is really about how it might be done, not if it could be done. Therein lies the strategic significance of Bitcoin. Chapter 4.9.7 Warfighting is a safety feature, not a bug. Another way to think about the complex emergent social benefit of warfighting is to think about fire safety. Fire safety engineers designed special doors called fire doors. Fire doors improve building safety because they contain and isolate fires in specific parts of a building to prevent them from spreading or to slow their expansion down. With this concept in mind, consider the function of national borders. National borders are forged by warfare and have essentially the same safety features as fire doors. When an abstract power hierarchy becomes hazardous, oppressive, national borders make it possible to contain or isolate this hazard to a specific region of the world and to prevent it from spreading. Thanks to national borders, exploitative and abusive abstract power hierarchies remain contained. So long as a population can do a good job at securing their own borders, then the only threat of oppression they have to worry about is oppression from their own ruling class. And so long as our species continues to do a good job at warfighting to divide control authority over our valuable physical resources, we can minimize the amount of damage that could be caused by a single oppressive ruling class. In other words, warfare is a safety feature, not a bug. It protects humans from themselves, particularly their exploitable belief systems. It prevents the spread of hazardous belief systems by physically constraining and containing them. Chapter 4.9.8 War is the exact same primordial game that all organisms play, but given a different name. In addition to helping sapiens protect themselves against the hazards of their own abstract belief systems, it could also be argued that warfighting has the same upsides as predation in nature. When sapiens engage in warfare, they engage in the same physical power projection activity other living organisms have engaged in for 4 billion years. It is therefore reasonable to believe that warfare could also produce the same complex emergent benefits that physical power projection competitions provide to all species, namely the ability to re-vector resources to those who are the strongest, most intelligent, and most capable of adapting to their environment, and therefore more capable of surviving in a world filled with predators and entropy. The explanation for why sapiens are so prone to warfighting could be the same explanation for practically everything else we observe in nature. What we see is what survives. There appears to have been many human polities over the past 10,000 years which did not raise militaries and did not go to war. We know these societies existed because we can find and dig up their mass graves and see how early and unpleasantly they died. It's not the case that peace-loving societies didn't exist. It's the case that peace-loving societies didn't survive. If we account for our survivorship bias, i.e. account for the fact that what we observe, including ourselves, went through a very rigorous selection process which weeded out a lot of other possibilities, then we can reframe a question about why sapiens fight wars in a way that's much easier to answer. Why do some societies believe they will be able to survive without warfighting? Or to put it differently, what gives humans the impression that they are the only animals in nature who have an inherent right to live peacefully without predators? Admittedly, survival of the fittest is an unsatisfying explanation for warfare. Like eating a head of lettuce, this explanation is neither salty nor sugary. It's a stoic explanation. It just is. It's neither a profound nor a romantic way to think about war. It's an amoral one which accepts physical conflict as natural behavior. This point of view does nothing to justify or reconcile the cruelty and bloodshed we see in war, nor how angry it makes us feel. And frankly, it's boring, not to mention super annoying, to be reminded of the fact 
that sapiens are just as ordinary and unremarkable as the wild animals we like to look down upon and believe we have outsmarted. It's also quite frustrating to think that despite how bulbous our foreheads are, we have not found a way to outsmart natural selection except only in our imaginations. Nevertheless, here we are, growling, snarling, scratching, snapping, and biting at each other over food and territory, no different than a pack of wolves or wildcats. The only difference seems to be the abstract thoughts filling our bulbous heads with reasons to justify or condemn our physical aggression. War is the same power projection game we can all independently observe in nature, just with a different name. Instead of primordial economics, people call it war. Instead of the survivor's dilemma, people call it national strategic security. Whatever names people choose to assign to these phenomena, and whatever fancy uniforms they like to wear, while they wage it, the first principles explanation of warfare remains the same, hence why it's called a first principles explanation. Sapiens are one of thousands of other species of pack animals playing the same primordial game, using physical power to establish their dominance hierarchy just like the rest. While perhaps not as emotionally satisfying as other pontifications about warfare, the previous chapter about power projection the previous chapter about power projection in nature can at least give the reader an appreciation for why and how warfare works without complicating our understanding of the matter with abstract and unfalsifiable ideologies. Wars can easily be explained using basic principles of physics and biology. If we can wrap our heads around the complex emergent benefits of power projection in nature, then we should be able to understand the complex emergent social benefits of warfare. Despite how many other abstract explanations people and their bulbous foreheads have come up with over the last several thousand years. Chapter 4.9.9 War Highlights Lessons Learned About Survival and Countervailing Entropy as discussed in the beginning of this chapter, we live with the immense burden of being prisoners trapped behind our own prefrontal cortices. We cannot see or experience the world as it is. We can only experience a version of the world that has been filtered through a minefield of emotionally charged abstract thoughts and symbolism. Like looking through a pair of rose-tinted glasses, sapiens look at the world through ideology-tainted glasses. This makes it very difficult to present arguments about the benefits of warfare on society without it being complicated by abstract ideas like ethics, morals, theologies, or modern politics. The solution? Simply don't call it warfare. Call it something else, like primordial economics. In case it wasn't already clear to the reader, the previous chapter about power projection tactics in nature was a clandestine attempt to get the reader to understand and appreciate the necessity and complex emergent social benefits of warfighting. These benefits are backed by science and lots of independently validated empirical evidence with naturally occurring data sets that can be analyzed ex post facto for causal inference. Like most clandestine operations, an argument about why warfighting is good for society must be presented to people in this manner because it is a highly illicit activity. It goes against social custom to explain why warfare is good for society. To circumnavigate conflicting ideologies regarding warfare, the author provided a detailed argument for the emergent benefit of warfare without calling it warfare. Just by changing the name of the activity and using non-human examples, like the origin story of birds and mammals, it's possible to provide a logical, first principles, grounded theory about the necessity and merit of warfare that is backed by science and loads of empirical evidence. As a refresher, the logic presented in the previous chapter was as follows. Power projection competitions give life an accelerated existential imperative to innovate, self-optimize, and vector-limited resources to organisms which are demonstrably more fit for survival in a congested, contested, competitive, and hostile environment, an environment they don't have the option of escaping. 
physical power projection competitions and predation have a causally inferable tendency to make life stronger, more organized, more intelligent, more adaptable, and thus more capable of countervailing the entropy of the universe. Now understand this crazy connection. If you have a piece of software in cyberspace, a security system, a monetary system, a system, a software in cyberspace that everybody agrees to use, that is this physical power projection competition, just as it exists in nature, it will have all the same traits I just listed in that last paragraph. Your money your money system, the way you secure it, would be stronger, more organized, more intelligent, more adaptable, and thus more capable of countervailing entropy of the universe or predation from inflation and our abstract power hierarchies or governments. That with every attack against it, it gets stronger. If the reader understands this logic, then they should be able to understand why it's reasonable to believe that warfighting provides the same complex emergent benefit to humans too. War is effectively the same power projection game with a different name, so it stands to reason that warfare would have the same complex emergent properties for humans as it would for other organisms. We can validate from our own experiences that warfare appears to give society the ability to self-optimize and ensure their limited resources are vectored toward the subset of the population who are more fit to survive in congested, contested, competitive, and hostile environments. Warfare clearly appears to help society become more capable of countervailing the entropy of the universe. We have no shortage of empirical evidence to back this theory. We see it practically everywhere on and off Earth.